little bit about the work I've been doing to test the historical contingency of mutation effects. <clears throat> and as evolutionary biologists, we're sort of generally interested in this relationship between genotype, phenotype, and fitness. And this wouldn't be that big of a deal to understand if everything were additive. So if you imagine this case where there's two alternative alleles, A and B, each contributing an arbitrary amount of fitness here, they're equal, um, <clears throat> we combine those two together, then you get exactly double that amount. So this would be the case where uh, we just have an additive, uh, any, a lack of interaction. But of course, that's not the case. So for the most part, the relationship between genotypes to phenotypes and phenotypes to fitness is actually very complex. And for the rest of this, and this was referred to as a genotype, which is phenotype fitness in that. And for the rest of this talk, I'm just gonna go directly from genotype to fitness, um, just, just so that you're aware. So <clears throat> when this is not additive, we refer to this as epistasis. So again, I have this case of the two alleles, A and B, and uh, you can see that when you combine them, you get a fitness indicated by the top of this gray box that is that deviates from our expectation of combining the two. And so these episodic interactions make that map that I just described very difficult to interpret. <clears throat> and I'm just gonna walk you through a couple different cases of epistasis just so that we're on the same page. So again, this is the case very similar to the previous slide that I showed where we have um, time along the x-axis and fitness on the y-axis. And just imagine that we had two alternative evolutionary trajectories, uh, both starting from a common ancestor here, E. coli, where in one case, uh, on the bottom, we see that there's a mutation that fixes that I just indicated here by a square that contributes a 5% fitness benefit. And in the other case, we have a star that contributes 10. And then after that mutation fixes, we get another fixation. In this case, it's the square again. And again, it contributes 5%. So there's no interaction there. But when there is, it could be negative. So we could have, instead of another 5% here, it's actually a 3% reduction down to 2%, so it would be a negative episodic interaction. The opposite of that could also be true, where we have a positive interaction here, some additional 5% on top of that. And of course, the extreme of either of those scenarios would be sign epistasis. So in this case, I showed the extreme negative, where this ben originally beneficial will, when it <coughs> arises in the presence of this star mutation is now costly. So why we care about this is because how beneficial mutations interact can influence how a population adapts on this adaptive landscape. So if we have uh, this solid line here, again, time and fitness, uh, the solid line represents no epistasis, so the additive uh, case or multiplicative, depending on the, the model you, you use. So that's no epistasis. If there's negative epistasis between beneficial mutations, you, the population could adapt to a lower fitness peak somewhere on that landscape. And if you have higher, uh, sorry, if you have positive epistasis, then you can see that you get those additional beneficial effects or positive effects, and you can adapt to a higher peak. So people have sort of tried to understand how beneficial mutations <coughs> in the population interact, and what they've done is create these sorts of fitness, mutation fitness landscapes. So this is from a paper from my lab, Dr. Cooper's lab that I'm in uh, <laughs> five years ago. Uh, and so this is a, a long-term evolution experiment, similar to the one in Dr. Lenski's lab, that they took the first five uh, mutations that, that fixed in this population and they basically created all potential combinations of those mutations. And here, the actual adaptive path that was taken is denoted by these heavier, larger black arrows. So this study uh, is one example. There's been a couple other ones. And they generally find negative epistasis between all of these interactions. Uh, but some of them actually show that along this path, you see uh, more positive epistasis, at least in relation to the rest of the landscape. So well, something I'd like to point out is that these sorts of studies are, if we care about how the mutations along that natural path interact, these are really just anecdotal. So these only contain the first five mutations of one population. And so what I'm trying to do is look at how 
these interactions change in order in replication. And I can do that by reverting a focal mutation or a mutation that occurs ideally early in adaptation. So you imagine a mutation that arises some at an early time point with a given beneficial fitness effect, and you get subsequent fixations over time. If it doesn't interact at all with any of those mutations, it's the fact that it remain constant over time. If it interacts negatively, it's initially beneficial effect would start to decline because the net effect would decrease. And if it interacts positively, reverting that mutation, you would not only lose the initial beneficial effect, but you'd also lose those positive interactions. So something we can do to sort of get a little more insight into how this works, oh, sorry, I skipped one slide here. So the hypothesis here is that um, if there is that uh, historical contingency or the dependence of fixing beneficial mutations on their genetic background, we expect that reverting an early focal mutation, will, its fitness will increase over time due to those positive, uh, positive effects. So what we can do to get some insight to how that might work is use a model. So this is Fisher's geometric model. And this is a phenotypic, a model of phenotypic um, adaptation where an organism is represented by a single point in this n-dimensional space, and these n-dimensions represent n phenotypes of that population that are important for fitness or being selected upon. So an organism is a point, then the optimal combination of phenotypes is also a point. And here in this case on the left, you can see that the optimum is at the origin, and as you decrease fitness, you get this fitness peak, fitness increases, and mutations on that landscape are vectors because they change the phenotypes of an organism. If you're in simulations, you can see that the population then adapts, increases in fitness by a series of these uh, mutation vectors. So just to show you that this model is appropriate, I've actually taken some of the long-term evolution data from the Lenski lab up to 50,000 generations. This is a paper that came out uh, three years ago now. And the data is in red, and I just wanted to clarify that the, the red isn't actually their data points, it's just the model that they derived that is a model of diminishing returns that best, best fits their data. And then I took their parameters for population size and mutation rate and made a couple assumptions about the way mutations work, which I won't go into right here, but you can see that Fisher's model fits that very closely. And there's multiple examples of this in the literature, it also has produces good fits to epistasis data. So what I can do is just do the exact same sort of reversion in this model. And this is just uh, for visualization's sake, I've left it at two dimensions. I'm not, I don't have the ability to visualize above three, so I figured none of the rest of you did. Um, so this ancestor adapts towards the optimum by four mutations here. And all I did is just revert that mutation, just de subtract the vector at each point, and test the effect over time. And you can see that regardless of complexity, organismal complexity, which is represented by the number of dimensions in this landscape, here 2, 5, and 10, the fitness effect on the y-axis over, here's step number just indicates which mutation we're at in that path. Uh, regardless of complexity, the fitness effect decreases over time. There's some specific cases if you look at individual runs. These are uh, 100 runs each, 100 simulations. Individual runs may increase slightly, but as complexity increases, really this curve just starts to shallow out, and it for sure never increases. So what I've done as well is do the same thing in an actual <coughs> organism. So in Dr. Cooper's lab, we have E. coli from a single ancestor that have been evolved for 8,000 generations in a variety of environments, which you can see here. This is from a paper published last year. In the columns, we have the evolution environments that are glucose, lactose, glucose combined with lactose, uh, glucose and lactose daily switching, and then 2,000 switching, where the shading is represented, representing lactose. And so I just want to show you these fitness trajectories, <coughs> and lucky enough for us, there's actually some replication in the sorts of mutations that have occurred early in these populations. So 
In 14 out of 24 populations that were involved at some point in lactose, they fixed a mutation in the LAC operon repressor, which causes constitutive expression of this operon. You can imagine that constitutively expressing that operon would be beneficial in, in abundant lactose. And you can see that here in the ancestor, there is about an 8% benefit. And so what that allows me to do is go into these evolved clones. I'm just showing you here on the right all of the populations where this mutation occurred. What that allows me to do is go into these evolved clones and just use a suicide plasmid with the ancestral functional copy of that repressor, replace the mutation here indicated by a large red X over that gene, and we get this construct where we still have all of these other evolved mutations, but we've just reverted that, <clears throat> that single mutation. And then we do two fitness competitions. One is just the evolved clone against the ancestor that gives us evolved fitness, and one is the construct against the ancestor that gives us the fitness of the evolved clone without the mutation. And the difference between these two then is the effect <coughs> of that mutation because that's the only thing that's different. So now I'll just show you some of my results. These are in the la constant lactose environment. There were five populations with fixed mutation. For three of them, there's a significant increase from 2,000 generations to 8,000 in the effect of that mutation. So here, this is showing you the difference between those two competitions that did. And you can see that on average, it increases from about 10% up to 30% fitness effect. And the other two populations are a bit tricky because it doesn't really do much here. And in population one, there's sort of this weird U shape. So I'm planning to sequence these and see which mutations actually arose and why they might interact, uh, in, at least in this case, negatively with, uh, with that lack mutation. So this one I find particularly interesting. This is the lactose to glucose 2000 switching environment. There's only one population here that fixed the mutation. And so just to walk you through this, the first 2,000 generations were in lactose, then 2,000 in glucose, then from four to six here was in lactose. At some point in there, this mutation fixed, and it's slightly beneficial, though not significantly, at, uh, at 6,000 generations. And we know that in the ancestor, um, mutations that inactivate the LAC I gene, the repressor, are costly in glucose, in which this population was evolved for these 2,000 generations, but the fitness effect increases over time. So this is actually indicating that there's some compensatory mutations going on there, that whatever trade-offs this mutation has are then compensated for by subsequent mutations, and when you remove them, you not only remove that fitness benefit, but also those positive interactions. And lastly, I'll just show you this daily switch that I have. Uh, so every day we switch from glucose to lactose, and here I only have data up to 4,000 generations for three populations, but you can see that there's a clear increase in the effect of that over time. So overall, this seems to indicate that the subsequent mutations are contingent upon uh, that lack of mutation for their beneficial effects, and the dependence ends up sort of entrenching the initial early mutation into the genetic background, such that when you re revert it over time, the fitness effect uh, increases, the fitness cost increases. And I think I have time for a question or two.